the topic for tonight is Armenian Genocide Education Reaching Into the School Curriculum. This 90th year of commemorating the Armenian Genocide has been a, been a benchmark year uh, for educating and teaching the Armenian Genocide. Whether it be at the beginning when Ambassador John Evans used the word uh, Armenian Genocide on his tour of the country, or recently this past uh, week, the Istanbul Conference uh, dealing with the uh, events of 1915, uh, it is at the forefront, as you can see, in the media and throughout the uh, world. Basically, this curriculum, the Facing History curriculum, came about because of a, a lot of hard work that's taken place over the years. And I would be remiss if I do not uh, acknowledge the contribution of Carol Mingar, Tom, and Lisa Blumenthal, who basically funded uh, this curriculum project. Also, people like uh, Dr. Richard Hovanesian, who worked for years putting this together. And Richard has been behind the scenes uh, with other scholars, uh, starting with a, uh, uh, the Armenian National Institute, which is a sister organization of the Armenian Assembly. Uh, there was a, a specific event in uh, Washington that took place at the Library of Congress. These materials that have been put together and compiled by scholars are the fruits of what is in this book today. And Richard, welcome to uh, our neck of the woods, and thank you for all your years of hard work as the senior acquisition department. <laughs> this past Tuesday, I met with Ambassador John Evans in Washington, and he is, of course, the most recent uh, elected uh, or ambassador who has used the word genocide. And uh, as we know, it's obvious that government, there's governmental pressure not to speak out about genocide, or Samantha Power says, to be an upstander, not a bystander. So the work that we have before us uh, in school systems is to educate people and young students and the sensitivities of genocide and Holocaust. This curriculum is such a wonderful piece that we can all work towards to help fund the, fund the project so that the book does get into mainstream classrooms across the country. So it is my honor to invite up uh, Mark Mamigonian, who, by the way, I have to say personally, when, when Adam and I were running around the country doing the work that we do, we kept saying, Mark, should we do it here? Should we do it there? Should we postpone it? Mark was really behind getting this done and having this conference. So Mark, thank you so much for driving this event. And uh, it was a pleasure to work with you. And I pledge that the Armenian Assembly will continue to work with Facing history and uh, and uh, Nasser to make sure that this curriculum does get out in the marketplace. Thank you, Mark. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I just want to briefly let you know what the next hour or or more will hold. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists, and I will ask each of them to speak for 10 minutes or so on, on issues connected with, with the topic for tonight that they feel are particularly important that they want to stress. Uh, that will be followed by some discussion among the panelists with some direct questions, and then we'll open it up to you folks. Uh, clear. Please submit questions in writing on cards, which will be circulated during, during the program, and then I will read them to the panelists. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Dr. Richard Hovanesian is the Armenian Educational Foundation Professor of Modern Armenian History at UCLA. He is one of the most distinguished scholars of modern Armenian history in general, and the Armenian Genocide in particular with many, many books and articles uh, bearing his name as author or editor. Margot Stern Strong is the executive director of Facing History and Ourselves, and she has been in the forefront of the uh, efforts to get genocide education into school curriculums for uh, over a quarter of a century. Adam Strong, who is related to Margot, in case you're wondering at the coincidence of the names, is the Director of Research and Development of Facing History and Ourselves, and he is one of the main people responsible for this tremendous book 
that facing history and ourselves has produced. Crimes against humanity and civilization, the genocide of the Armenians. Uh, uh, a book really that uh, is, is it's the first book of its kind that really presents the Armenian genocide in this fashion that can be digested by, by students on the secondary school level as well as uh, older students. Dr. Henry Terrio is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Worcester State College. He writes and speaks frequently uh, on issues relating to the Armenian genocide and, and uh, comparative genocide and uh, is someone who we will be hearing a lot from, I think, in the years to come on this subject. And I would like to ask Professor Hermanesian to lead off to begin the baseball parlance for the evening and offer some remarks. Thank you very much. And uh, talking about baseball parlance, I guess I have to apologize. Uh, Mr. Maragunian first asked me to come last night for a program, and I couldn't come because I'm teaching. Uh, and so today I realized that uh, we're going head to head with the uh, Red Sox and the Yankees. Uh, and, you know, historians are not supposed to ask the question if, uh, because it happens. So you can't ask if so and so didn't happen. But one would wonder. Uh, if this were held last night, would we have a different audience or not? It would be a very interesting comparison. I'd like to have known, but I can never find out. Uh, in any case, thank you for the uh, uh, evening. And uh, I just find that we're in very exciting times. Uh, those of us who have lived uh, so long and have struggled for so many years to have acknowledgement of the Armenian genocide so we know our own suffering, the world would know our suffering, be able to go on with our lives, and the, the topic of, or the subject of my last, the title of my last book was Looking Backward, Moving Forward, and that's really what my aspiration is for us as a community, to not forget the past, to be able to look at the past, to deal with the past, but also to move forward uh, with, uh, in, in, as they say in Armenian, Batschagadov, without being uh, so hung up uh, on the past that we can't face the future, and there, there have been a lot of things in the last uh, few years that have given me a great deal of hope. Uh, and most recently, uh, uh, Tony mentioned uh, a conference in Istanbul that has just concluded with uh, a very a large number of Turkish scholars speaking to themselves, no non-Turks whatsoever, Turks uh, speaking to themselves, uh, they don't talk about the Armenian genocide, they talk about the events at the end of the Ottoman Empire. That's okay, they, don't, they cannot use the G word yet, but they will. Well, the important thing is that they're talking about the issues for the first time to themselves within the country of Turkey, and it gives us hope that with the development of civil society in this country, that there, uh, there, uh, the public debate will take place. Uh, and they will themselves come to know themselves as they need to do. I mean, we're talking about the term facing history and ourselves. And one of the points that I made, I was in Houston very recently at, a, at the Holocaust Museum in Houston, where there was a large contingent of Turkish um, uh, public there, having come with literature, denial literature by, um, from their embassy, etc., ready to be hostile, etc. Well, I immediately tried to disarm them by pointing to the fact that, uh, that they needed to deal with their history, to face their history for their own benefit, not for the benefit of the Armenians, but for themselves. And that, uh, unfortunately, as I pointed out to them, that the denial has not allowed uh, the Armenians to acknowledge all the good Turks and Arabs and Muslims that there were in 1915, because nearly every Armenian story of survival, and those of you whose parents or grandparents survived, probably every one of them talks about a good Turk who protected them or saved them or took them in. And so that's, you know, now they're, they're moving in that direction. I have only 10 minutes, I make just three or four points. One is, in recent years, my point has been uh, the Armenian genocide will be forgotten and buried in history as most other genocides have been, unless it can be integrated into collective human memory, unless it becomes a part of human history. 
unless it can go outside of a national ethnic history and become a universal history. For Armenians, it's enough. Armenians have suffered enough that it's so immediate to them. They lost the homeland, they lost uh, relatives. They'll never forget that. That's a part of them. But if you want to be able to, and I, I forget the crudeness of the word, but if you want to market, if you want to package, you have to, if you want to persuade and to convince and to make and feel it's important enough to be a part uh, of of uh, collective memory, then you have to be able to integrate it. And we've made enormous strides in the last 10 years in that more and more authors with non-Armenian names are integrating the Armenian genocide into their writings. The very last book that I published, again, looking back and moving forward, has more non-Armenian authors than Armenian authors within it, and includes for the first time even a Turkish author, which is, again, progress from where we've been. And that's what Facing History's um, uh, resource book is intending to do. Uh, the, uh, the genocide of the Armenians, uh, the uh, crimes against humanity and civilization uh, book, a book, this is not a book, but it's a book, it's 200 and some pages. It tries to make sense out of the Armenian experience, make sense in a modern world. And this is something, again, that I would emphasize. Armenians, uh, think that because a million and a half of them perish, that the world owes them something very special. And, you know, we forget that the 20th century, our century, was uh, one that took more than 100 million lives, innocent lives of civilians. Some people would say 150 million. So what does one million mean? One and a half million mean? It doesn't mean much, especially in the modern world where we are so uh, uh, accustomed to seeing violence. And so we're not even able to, to give the, what, what it means, what that one and a half million means, that is its destruction of the way of life, destruction of the civilization, destruction of the homeland, end of roots. I mean, how many of us can go back four generations and trace our ancestors? Very few of us, because we were cut from the roots. And that's a very you know, traumatic event. And so facing history will begin with uh, what some people look like games. They're talking about identity. Who am I? Who are you? And that's important in particularly an American environment where we have all these various groups of ethnic groups and competing uh, identities. Who am I? What am I? Is, uh, is a very important issue. And as from that point, they will go on to try to raise questions. One of the problems, you know, the traditional old uh, what we talked about, der totik school. I don't know if you've heard that phrase or not. Der totik ivarjana. Der totik was the priest who had the rod, and people had to memorize everything. Wrote, wrote, you learn, you know, you, you recited the Bible, you did everything, and if you didn't do it, you got whipped. And, uh, and that, was, that was der totik school. But the concept today is people and young people have to learn to think. They have to be able to maneuver in this very complex society in which we live, to be able to make choices, to understand what is obedience and what is being loyal, what is being patriotic and what is being criminal, to be able to, to answer questions. You know, the Armenians had to face very serious questions throughout their history. And the answers they gave uh, really was not more frequently matters of life and death. Uh, I mean, going back to 1915, a very simple question is, convert to Islam, you will be saved. If you don't convert, you're dead. I mean, that's a choice. Wow. And it's a very extreme choice. But there are many choices prior to that that can be made and should be made and are made. And not only by the victim who has that choice, but the person giving that choice. Uh, and so, facing history in ourselves has attempted uh, with uh, these kinds of thought-provoking questions to young students living in very different environments in the United States of America who don't even know where Armenia is, who have never heard of Armenia, uh, and you know, I'm sorry to say that many young Armenians also don't know this, but they're trying to use this as a case study for broader humanitarian uh, purposes to make the lives, our lives today better, 
and ultimately by making our lives better and making us better citizens also to help us to stand up to uh, crimes against humanity or events that will lead to crimes against humanity. And for that reason, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's filled with uh, photographs and there's some wonderful poetry by Diana Dierovanesian who uh, deals uh, a lot with these issues, uh, or many excerpts from Peter Balakin's work and others, Valerie uh, and others who have done. And that's another thing, you know, it's very effective to read a lot of first person uh, experiences that go, that are interspersed with the, um, uh, with the uh, other kinds of uh, activities that go on with this work. So, my, uh, in conclusion, I've taken my 10 minutes. Uh, I would say that uh, we are on uh, a new threshold, we're on new ground. It's both positive and negative. Where the negative side is that we're in the 21st century, the Armenian genocide occurred nearly a century ago. It has very little relevance to many people who feel that anything that happened more than 20 years ago is not relevant in their lives. And the farther we move away from the Armenian genocide, the less possibility there can be probably toward what many Armenians still feel is important is not only recognition, but there should be some kind of recompense and restitution. The recompense and restitution become more and more difficult, but recognition becomes all the more so possible. And also learning from the Armenian experience for its own value, but also for its uh, being integrated into the broader. I'm, I'm very pleased, as I say, that growing numbers of non-Armenian scholars, civil rights activists, recognize that this was a watershed event, that the Armenian genocide was in many ways the prototype of mass killing in the 20th century. There have been mass killings throughout history, but the 20th century mass killings driven by ideology, driven by belief system, driven by many modernization, the downside of modernism, uh, is all characterized in the Armenian genocide and will be repeated. It's, you know, for the Armenians, it was not a dress rehearsal. It was the real act. But if you want to look at the Holocaust history, it was a dress rehearsal for the Holocaust. Because all of the, nearly every one of the factors influencing the Armenian genocide, bringing it about, were repeated 25 years later. And we, these are very important lessons and a legacy to learn and our young people need to know. Thank you very much. Good evening to you all. I am in the perfect position for I am the bridge, and that's what facing history is, a bridge between the past and the scholars of, the, of that past and the future. And facing history takes the scholarship of Richard Hovanesian and the narrative of Peter Balakian and the stories that come from your parents and your grandparents and with the urging of people like Manu Young, who for 30 years has been, longer, Manu, 30 years, has been a friend of facing history, quiet, humble, full of humility, but determined that the Armenian genocide story find its place in facing history and ourselves. And we then have become the bridge from Richard to the future. And it's appropriate that Adam be sitting to my left, and then to the left of Adam be the person who advises him, coaches him, consults with him, argues with him, debates with him, discusses with him. And now, instead of me talking about this history, it comes from Adam to me. So I know Henry through Adam, and Adam knows Richard through me. And through this book now designed by Adam's wife, let's keep this in the family. This is the extraordinary painting of Gorky and his mother. Y'all have seen this? 
If you haven't seen it as a lesson plan, then you haven't known it. And so I sit at Adam's feet, unlike the traditional scene where a child learns from parent, I learned from Adam so much more than I could have ever understood about this history by myself. This has been an adult development for me. When Manu first appeared, I don't remember why you appeared, Manu. I don't remember what happened. But when you first appeared, and we used to come to meet you and your colleagues and your library and your books and your friends, and they became our speakers little by little, I immersed myself in, in that history. I learned it. And you have to do that if it doesn't come from your mother or your father or your uncle or your grandparent. If it isn't your own history passed down through your own family. And so he was my conduit. And then when we would reach out and ask Richard Hovindesian to come and teach us more, he came. And he began to help us think through how we could think about the denial of this history. What happens to history that's re revised and denied beyond the stories that we were learning from Holocaust and genocide survivors of the Armenian genocide. So it was a developmental journey that began for me 30 years ago as I immersed myself in the history we created our own little tiny study guide. Bill Parsons was assigned to that when he was at Facing History. And that was our first resource book, separate than the Holocaust and Human Behavior Resource Book. Since that time, we produced many, many resource books. After that little book was out, and we began to teach about the Armenian Genocide, it always happened that whenever I would speak about it, people would come up and say, oh, I didn't know you were Armenian. There was still this balkanization that if you were speaking about someone's history, it means you must be of that history. It doesn't happen when I talk about the Civil Rights Movement or the Middle Passage or Black America. People don't come up and say, um, I didn't know you were black. I didn't know you were an African American, but you can bet it definitely happens with the Armenian Genocide. And it happens to our staff all the time. When they're talking about the Holocaust, people will come up and assume they're Jewish. We still somehow need to balkanize or assign these histories that really are human histories and very much, very much the history for all of us if we care at all about prevention. But we still think that these histories belong only to a particular group. And often that has been for Jews the way the Holocaust was taught in their Sunday schools and in their day schools. And for Armenians too, in their Armenian day schools. But I think with Facing History and Ourselves, it was one of the very first times that the Armenian history and the lessons of that history were part of a national and now an international organization. And one that demanded that the staff learn that history and see what was particular about the history and what was universal about it, so that you could honor its particularity, but that you could wrench it from the ownership and the stereotype that would belong to only one group and bring it in to the human narrative, which I think we have begun to do. And may we leave the precedent that we have begun to develop uh, to the next generation to develop it further. After that first tiny resource book was put together. It was blue bound and full of small articles and some history. There wasn't very much to really pull from at the time for us 30 years ago. We then decided when we revised our first Holocaust and Human Behavior resource book, I decided that I would rethink where this history belonged. And I was telling Adam the other day, I can remember the long nights at home in Brookline. My husband, Terry Strong, is here. He remembers then, too. <coughs> and I would stay up late at night. I can literally see myself cutting and pasting. But also, that's a metaphor for what I was doing with the Armenian Genocide. I was desperately trying to intertwine the histories of the Holocaust with the history of the Armenian Genocide in the way 
I, I think about my husband, an immunologist, a researcher, studying DNA. <coughs> if it weren't for Watson, there wouldn't have been that visual structure that we all now can begin to think about when we understand that great scientists are doing great things. We can't quite know everything they're doing, but we know the bridge to their work is through this visual, this DNA. Well, I was looking for a visual, a DNA at night. How do I write about the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust so that I preserve the particularity of the history, but I show that they're intertwined and they must be intertwined if I move the organization beyond memorializing events to truly believing that you can judge them and then you must use them for prevention. And so Facing History has spent all of its efforts trying to tell the stories of this first genocide of the 20th century, to show how it was precedent for the second, all the way to the roles of the German generals who were there at the Armenian planning, the genocide planning. We immersed ourselves in the controversy over the word massacre and genocide. We didn't duck the controversy, we confronted it, but we never did it alone. Richard Hovanesian was our partner who came to institutes, he has continued to do that for 30 years, he came to public events, he's continued to do that, he's driven in the snow with Adam, I don't know if they're planning to do that again, to Providence, but he has lived, hope so. He's literally been the, the scholar that Facing History needed in order to give us the legitimacy that we needed to be able to push forward with this history so that we be in public consciousness and be used to think about prevention. I'll give you an example. Last year, Adam planned an online distance course. There are three million educators who come to the Facing History website with no marketing and no branding every month. And they stay an average of 20 minutes. eBay at one point was 26 minutes. And we now can track who they are and what they're looking for. There are more people interested in the history of the Armenian Genocide than I bet you could possibly imagine here. And it's not because their grandfather or their parent was a survivor, or because the story was passed down in the water and the dinner table or at the ritual. It is because there is something now legitimately called comparative genocide studies. And it's not that people are trying to look for what Martha Menno calls victim Olympics. How many people have died in one genocide, how many in another. But it is, in fact, because there are extraordinarily important lessons to be culled from these histories that will someday awaken the consciousness Maybe not in our lifetime, but building on our precedent and leaving this legacy, it will awaken the consciousness of the policymakers, and practice will change. You have to only have that hope if you have children like Adam and friends like Facing History has, and Manu and Richard Hoganisia, and in a new generation of Henry and of Peter Balakian and others. And many of the staff of Facing History, 110 people across the country, are as committed to this history as Adam. Not quite as Adam. Adam drinks and sleeps in it sometimes. I do think he is, I mean. <laughs> in fact, my husband just asked me, what is the I at the end of the name? Does it mean son of, as a, belonging to? So Adam didn't change his name from Vosser's throne to Strom to Stromenian, and you may have to. Because in fact, he, 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 he teaches us every day. I, I know the belt is wrong, so I want to say one, one thing, two things. After Adam started this online internet forum last year, so that people coming to our website could do deep work on this history, he created a three-day online forum. And Richard Hovanesian, the technology genius that he is in the 21st century, was coaxed into this online forum by Adam, 
and people, 250 people were in conversation, better conversation than you could have at a conference because you can only ask one question, doing in-depth work, and here's how they did it. Adam designed the first day to be about the particularity of the history, what happened. What was Morgenthau witnessing? Why didn't people listen? Who were the bystanders? What does an upstander look like? And what in the world were these perpetrators up to? And why must they have perpetrated this violence in such a vulgar and miserable and determined way? What was this human behavior about? The second day was reflection on the history. What has happened to that history? since it first was recorded. What has happened to it as it's become part of the controversies among nations, including the United Nations, when Dole, year after year, has tried to make it officially recognized within the United States. What happened to it? How was it politicized? Why was it denied? Why is it still a criminal act in Turkey to speak about it and write about it? That would go its way too, I believe. The third day, Adam brought Eric Reeves, who is documenting, analyzing, and passionately full of outrage, and begging the human community, including the Armenian community and the Jewish community, and any of those communities more sensitive to this history of genocide than others, to pay attention to Darfur. And he was able to connect in these three days the exact work of facing history. So Terry, does DNA have three strands? Two? Why does it look like it has three? Because it goes around like that? <laughs> Double helix. Double helix with an interpretation of the outsider, facing history and ourselves. Adam made three days out of this history. He brought the history, the reflection on the history, and then he brought it to the ourselves part. And it is the ourselves part that makes facing history different. Because it says at the end of the chapter, at the end of this work, that you literally can prevent genocide. Otherwise, I don't think Armenian genocide history or Holocaust history should be in a classroom. Because you can go to a museum or a memorial and you can learn your history facts. But if you are in a classroom to learn this history, it is because it is to empower you, hopefully, to save someone else's life in the future. So I am committed to turning this over to Adam. And Adam, and, is it Henry after Adam? Yeah. And Richard and I probably will be able to sit back very soon and let the next generation take over. Look, Adam, before you speak, I need to make a, an important announcement. Adam. I'm going to go up there. I can't sit. Can we first applaud Margot? No. I would like to. <laughs> it, it is really a plus to, to Richard and, Mar and Margot, actually. So. And what you all don't know, and I don't think people knew during that online forum that she's describing, is Richard's in his office at 5 o'clock in the morning in this online forum. I couldn't believe that I was reading the times that he was posting and then translating that into California time. I mean, oh my God, I shouldn't have asked him because he's clearly committed so much time to this. And, and, and that's, what, that's what he does. You ask, you ask Richard and he comes. And you know, I, just, I got off the phone because I'm trying to talk to the different offices that we have. they asking how they're beginning to integrate this material into workshops around the country. So the Chicago staff said, we got Richard coming, he's doing three events for us, and you know, and, you know, you ask, and he's been so, so generous with this time. He, he, uh, he knows how much, how grateful I am, so I won't embarrass him anymore. And, uh, and, and Henry too, and, and Henry knows, every time I found myself locked in a dilemma around scholarship on the Armenian genocide, said, Henry, help, give me a sense of the perspectives here, what's going on? And he also said something that I think is really important, because, Denial gets in your way as you're starting to tell a story. And I remember we were at this moment, I, I, you know, I, I want to use this story. And I've also read this tremendous amount of denial on this piece. And I called Henry, I said, do I use the story or do I not use the story? And Henry says, you know what, Adam? 
Every significant moment of this history has been attacked by genocide deniers. He said, that's, he said it's important, they know it. That, do you, you remember this conversation? That, that's, what, that's why there is such critique of this. And so you have to be confident in your source, and if you're confident in the source, you go forward and you clue that in. And, and even though things are changing, and I'm, and I'm a, a real optimistic, though there's a lot of change going on, when you go search for the Armenian genocide on the web, take a look at what you find. Actually, Henry knows what he, Henry's been uh, targeted most recently on tallarmeniantale.com. I think you were, I think you were targeted. Uh, a, a colleague of mine is doing a workshop, actually, she did it yesterday among them. I was looking for material on Armin Wagner. And what did she run into? More denialist material on Armin Wagner than she could actually run into actual true historical material about it. So we're changing, and I think with Samantha Power and with Gary Bass, I think people are starting to put this into a larger narrative. It is, it's been the struggle of facing history for a very long time. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's still a precarious moment. I worry about it, actually, because if people start to become interested in this history and they don't have a hand to hold them, you know, where, where do they, what material do they start to find? And that's why the resources and the professional development are so extraordinarily important. So, I, I won't say to you all the ways that the Armenian Genocide ha has changed, although I think that it is important to recognize it, but I think there's some familiar stories. So I want to talk a little bit about what the, what's it like to try to bring this material into the classroom, and, uh, and to think about why in the world would a non-Armenian care about this history, from its particularity, uh, which I, I think is very important. So, you all know, at least I would, I would hope that people know that Massachusetts actually mandates the teaching of the Armenian genocide in schools. It's, it's written into the framework. If you, you, if you go down, you know, you're, when you're teaching World War I, that, and actually several significant points related to the Armenian genocide are, are part of the, the Massachusetts frameworks. New York requires teaching on the Armenian genocide. Actually, how many of you all saw the newspaper yesterday where they're talking about educators now battling over educational mandates? You know, that now, there's a con now there's a concern that human rights related mandates are going to dominate history, it kind of, it's, a, it, it's the backlash. And you know, it's a problem. Because teachers who start to teach about human rights related issues, who start to, are interested in human behavior, are interested in questions of prevention, as they start to take this material out of the classroom, know that it's an uphill battle. It's not what the state tests require. So California has a mandate on teaching about the Armenian genocide, but it's not the mandates that for the most part drive curriculum. It's, it's a pressure on what's going to get tested or not. This is kind of the culture that, that we're in where teachers are really interested in trying to get their students to think deeply, to think critically about information. And yet we're, we're in an uphill battle where there's a sense of recognition and understanding that this is important, but also in an age of accountability. We haven't quite figured out what we want our students to know and what we want them to be accountable for. It's not just that one day. It's these larger questions of moral decision making and, and reflection. So, in traditional textbooks, as you all probably know, the Armenian Genocide is given scant attention, if, if attention at all. I mean, the, yeah, I have to say, despite the perception, it's still true with the Holocaust. I think people assume that it's part of uh, textbooks, and it's, you know, the paragraph that's in there. The, uh, so, from an educator's point of view, often, the sense that an educational mandate, you know, that you're supposed to do this, it often gets seen as an imposition. And it's not that they don't want to teach it. It's again, it's the reality of the text. It's, I'm supposed to teach a history that I may not know anything about. The textbook doesn't have it in there. So what are the resources that I'm going to use to start to take this in to the classroom? Who's going to help me? Especially this history that I understand because there's been a public controversy. I read the newspaper. It says Armenians say, Turks say. So who's going to help give me clarity as I start to take this material into the classroom? And again, it's why the resource book, it's why professional development is so incredibly important to this history. It's not enough to do, although I'm very happy with this, it's not enough to do what New Jersey did. The, the state of New Jersey with the Holocaust Commission, with the Armenian National Institute, with the Armenian Assembly, and with uh, Facing History and Ourselves actually playing this, a lesser role in this particular story. They, they bought several hundred copies of the Facing History and Ourselves resource book and distributed it to, to every middle and high school in New Jersey because they are, again, 
mandated to teach that. So for us, it's lovely that the material goes out, but what does it take to make sure that that gets into the classroom? It's professional development. And people aren't funding the professional development behind the mandate. And that's where individuals, organizations, have really been able to try to make a difference because we have the resources and we're ready to do it. But it's expensive. And it, to bring teachers together, uh, bring Richard in, in from California to, to introduce him to the class. But I want to talk about, again, I want to get to the particulars. I don't want to talk about the obstacles, I want to talk about the particulars of the Armenian genocide and what, what, what students who are non-Armenian will find. And I think Armenians too, as they kind of re rediscover their own history with another lens. I know that I've often looked at history of my own, my own community with a different lens. Uh, some of the non-Armenian scholars who've written about this are looking for groups to describe this last period. You know, what, what is this age, that we, the, the 20th century, now that we've passed it? So Samantha Power calls it the age of genocide. I was looking at uh, Richard Hofstetter's book the other day that begins in 1914 and describes the Armenian Genocide at the beginning of his uh, book, I guess one year into his book. And uh, his book is called The Age of Extremes. And basically the, the thesis of the book is that the 20th century was one great unbroken war. And now other people describe the 20th century as, it's interestingly, the age of human rights. So how do you, how do you bring all those different things together, genocide, war? human rights, and I think it's actually the Armenian Genocide is such an important central piece to begin to look at that history as that all comes together. Because that, that phrase that I think just kind of rolls across people's tongues now, you know, crime against humanity. We, we try people at the International Criminal Court now for a crime against humanity. But when that phrase comes in the context of the Armenian Genocide, I've been thinking more about this. It's an amazing shift of language. And, it's a, and with that amazing shift of language, it's an amazing shift of consciousness because this is, you know, you, if you're describing what happened, was, you know, you read the council reports, you know, they're, they're listing numbers of Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks getting massacred. But there was a recognition that you don't want to call it, it's not just that. It's not just that the Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks are getting killed. This is something bigger than that. And so, the, you know, there's this wonderful chapter in Gary Bass's book, Stay the Hand of Vengeance, where he's describing this. So the Allies are getting together, and they're trying to figure out what he called this. So the Russians are like, well, it's a crime against Christianity. And that's a larger group, you know? I mean, it makes, makes some sense. The Armenian's Christian. The, uh, the Ottoman Empire is primarily Muslim. But the language doesn't stay there. And in negotiation, there's a recognition. And it's not a crime against Christianity. It's a crime against humanity and civilization. So I've been thinking about morally, what do those different words mean? And so you get the notion of the civilization, right? And we can play on some of the terminology of the time, in the sense that there are civilized people, and the uncivilized people behave this sort of way. And so it could be labeled that way, or this could be a break of a pattern of what we expect of people. But then it goes more. I mean, it's humanity and civilization. And so there's a recognition in that word humanity that I'm human, you're human, those victims are human, and the perpetrators are human too. You know, you, I, it's easy to say, well, okay, pick on you for a second, Anthony. Oh, Anthony's not civilized, but he's human. So that phrase suggests something different. Helen Fine, in her work, she's a, a, a sociologist by training, but studies genocide, and Helen's interested in how communities learn to think about each other in genocide prevention. She coined a phrase that is really, really important. She talked about a notion of a universe of obligation. You know, the people that you care about, the people that you have some concern about. And with that phrase, a crime against humanity and civilization, suggests that certain, by, by virtue of certain actions, everybody should be part of our concern. It's genocide, it's different. Actually, the word genocide wasn't there. They're struggling, they're using race word murder, they're using massacre, they're struggling for language. To, uh, to capture the atrocity. But it's a philosophical shift, and that is a philosophical shift that's the underpinning of the human rights movement. You know, so where they're struggling, Henry Morgenthau is there in the middle of the Armenian genocide, and he's stuck because the national government doesn't want him to switch, to switch from these issues of national sovereignty. Because the international law, as Richard you know, points out, well, Henry, he, he, he didn't have an option. And, you know, the, the law says you can't intervene in other people's affairs. But there's a shift now. I don't know how many of you were following this, this last UN summit. 
Oxfam and Kofi Annan are trying to suggest now that there isn't just shouldn't just be an international law and prosecution for perpetrators of, of genocide, but in trying to make it illegal for countries not to respond when there is genocide. And so I think it takes us back to the origins of crimes against humanity and the term genocide, which it's so important not to divorce the term genocide from its roots. The story that Samantha Power begins her book with, the story of uh, Raphael Lemkin trying to make sense of why in the world that Talad is free and Talirian's on trial for, for murder. What, 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 what kind of moral justice he's struggling? Why is it a crime, he asks his law professor. Uh, why is it a crime to kill one person when it's, not a, when it's not a crime to kill a million people? And I think the Armenian genocide and Lemkin's coining of this UN now, the UN definition, the, the genocide convention, uh, are a real shift in the 20th century. The notion that, you know what? I'm actually responsible to people way beyond my borders. In the last couple of years have been, I think, a very strong reminder that things that may seem very, very far away in parts of the world that may seem very unfamiliar end up coming back home. So those places that in the Armenian genocide, those places on the map that kids may not be so familiar with, you said they can't find Armenia. But if you go look at a map of the former Ottoman Empire, they go, ooh, I've heard about the Balkans. I know a little bit about Iraq. And I think people are hungry to, do, to know more about this history. So what the resource book, and I think Henry, I mean, I think that Richard's got it absolutely right. The resource book is an attempt to put this history into the narrative of the 20th century. And I think that it is, and it should have always been there, because it's an essential, I think, for our understanding, the notion that as an individual reads about something that goes on beyond their borders, they struggle and try to figure out what to do with it. So the last story I want to end with is a real classroom story. So I, I worked with a teacher, went to this, uh, to the first Armenian Genocide Institute that we had last fall during the Red Sox World Series. <laughs> and uh, the, the teacher came away saying that her students have left with new questions about the world that she couldn't have imagined. Just, they, they, start, they start saying, and it's actually a, question, you know, a conversation, since it's all personal, it's a conversation my mother and I have had about this. You know, the students are so frustrated. If, if the United States called what's happening in Darfur a genocide, why isn't anybody trying to stop it? Where is the political will? And these are students, these budding young moral philosophers trying to make a difference. So she ended up class with an assignment. Samantha Power's book is full of a metaphor. She talks about wishing kids had a toolbox. She ended her class by having students create their own moral toolbox for the 20th century. What, after you've been through this class, do you wish they had to help guide you through this world? My, the, the tool that I think that sticks out in everybody's mind who's seen it is one of these kids asked for a moral compass. And I think that history, if taught well, has a potential to be a moral compass, something from which to reflect on. So thank you all very much. I hope you have a chance to uh, to take a look at the resource book and just please, 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 we need your help bringing this out into schools in Massachusetts and around the country and around the world. Thanks. I'm going to come up here for no other reason than I think Mark deserves a seat after all the work he's done putting this together. So. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this panel. This is a really important topic and one that is just emerging, I think, in people's minds within the Armenian community and with outside it, um, in large part because of the work um, that these three people, three people to my left have done. I mean, Richard, through his whole career, um, and facing, facing history um, through the work that they've been doing on this and through their whole overall um, set of concerns, which of course transcend the Armenian Genocide, even as they raise the Armenian Genocide up into this broader set of questions. Um, I could spend a lot of time thanking them for their work, thanking both sets of people for their work. Um, for Richard, I only want to say that uh, he's in the odd position of being both a historian of modern Armenian history and an incredibly important part of shaping that history and continuing to shape it. And he'll end up being studied as much as he's studied um, other people in that history. And, in a hundred years. And uh, of facing history, I just can't, I, I can only say that as an organization, it's, it's 
my model of what a truly great human rights organization is, and it's one that, uh, I mean, I use as a measuring stick for every other organization I encounter. I mean, it's just tremendous work that they've done from a really deep commitment um, to a, a set of universal human rights that never forgets the individual kinds of stories of the Armenian community and the Jewish community and the you know, Christians in the Darfur area or um, uh, you know, Muslims in Yugoslavia or any other group. Um, and I think it's a tremendous ability to put those two things together and to get those stories out there in a way that can affect everyone in a positive way and can help build for the kind of change so that hopefully the 21st century will just be a century of human rights and not a century of human rights and constant war. Um, I should say that the challenge of teaching on these kinds of issues is really significant. I think um, Adam started talking about some of these um, a couple of years ago, actually four years ago, time, time passes. I had um, helped organize a program at Worcester State where I teach on uh, the Korean, I actually was brought up the Korean couple women, but focused um, particularly on the Korean copper women who were enslaved during World War II by the Japanese military. Um, some of you will know that story. It's a, it's a horrible tragedy. As part of the broad, a broader examination of Japanese atrocities in the 1931 to 45 era. And uh, we had a professor who was teaching a course on World War II at the time. Um, it was towards the end of the course, maybe to, to let him off the hook a little bit, but I gave him a call and I said, you know, We've got this person who's made a film on this. The filmmaker's actually coming to do a panel at Worcester State. This is a big thing, she's internationally respected. All this stuff is happening. Um, and it's at the same time as your course, um, would you want to bring your students for an hour to, to watch this? And he said, geez, you know, um, that cute, you know, that kind of social stuff is really important, but I've only got so much time in my course, and I've got to really focus on the core issues. And of course, what I was thinking of is what could be more of a core issue of World War II than the tremendous cost in lives and the kinds of atrocities that were really um, just at the center of the, the, the conflict, if we can even call it that, in some ways, um, through that. And I wondered what kind of an education about World War II would these students get in? It's kind of like the History Channel sometimes, which is more like the War Channel. Um, all you get is, you know, pictures of bombers during World War II dropping bombs. You never find out what's happening on the ground, who's suffering, how they're suffering, what the social dynamics are, and so forth. Um, this dimension um, of wars and of other kinds of political and, and economic and, and um, maybe international issues is so important to understanding anything about those issues. And I guess that's my first point. Um, my second point is, um, in, in reference to the Armenian Genocide in particular, Maybe to pick up what others have said, I mean, for me, if you want to understand contemporary Turkey, you have to understand the Armenian Genocide. Um, it's had a tremendous impact, especially in its negation and denial. Um, it reveals very important things about where Turkey is today. Um, it reveals very important things about what Turkey, as Richard said, is not confronting in its history, and how that shapes, in a very negative way, in a, in a very dangerous way, the contemporary way that, that Turkish leaders and others look at the world. Um, and this, of course, isn't just about Turkey, because if you want to understand the contemporary Middle East, Turkey is a huge player. If you want to understand what's going on in Iraq, particularly northern Iraq, with the Kurds, Turkey is very important. If you want to understand what's going on with the Kurds, obviously, you have to understand in large part Turkish history with the Kurds. And that depends on understanding the Armenian Genocide and the legacy of that for Turkish governmental treatment of other minorities. So in a very direct way, if you want to understand the world, of course, you want to understand the global picture, of course, the Middle East is a very important part. In a very central way, understanding something as some people call specialized or narrow as the Armenian Genocide is a very important part of understanding the world today that we have. Um, I could say the obvious point is, if, and this again maybe picks up on something Richard had said in a different direction, if there's something that happens in an event in which a million to a million and a half people are intentionally killed, in itself that kind of justifies um, concern and study. The only problem is that if you just look at the 20th century, and I like to look at the 19th and 20th centuries together, I think the 19th century was in, in many ways just as bloody and, and devastating. It just wasn't the same sets of people in the same places with the same disability. Um, there are so many cases like that that we have to really think about, okay, how does the Armenian Genocide fit into this history of centuries of genocide. Um, and that is a legitimate question because we can look at many different cases that demand our attention. And especially when we're talking about a high school classroom, 
only so much time, so many resources, um, and, and so forth to get at those kinds of stories. I'm not saying that Darmian genocide should be taught always ahead of other things. Sometimes there have to be decisions, but I think it has a very important role in our understanding of a lot of different kinds of issues. I want to try to pick this up a little bit from what, uh, from a perspective, uh, again, that's been developing of what the Armenian genocide looks like from outside the Armenian community. I think Richard did a great job of, of explaining kind of the move from inside to outside. Um, one thing for me that's really important when we look at genocide and other kinds of mass violence in the world is the question of future prevention. And again, that's something that's come up. And one of the key problems in prevention is that quite often people don't know what they're seeing when it's happening. Average people. I think a lot of political leaders really know what they're seeing. But as long as they can convince their population, such in the United States during Rwanda, during Sudan now, and so forth, that there isn't an issue there, or that there's a vague, unclear set of things happening that intervention is not appropriate for. As long as they can do that, these kinds of things continue to happen. So genocide education, and I'm going to tie this to the Armenian genocide in a few moments in particular, but educating people about genocide and other mass violence is crucial for people to develop a consciousness to actually see the world as it is, in my opinion. And that's not necessarily a pretty picture. I, I, I applaud Adam because I think, uh, and I should say, let me say one thing I meant to say about Adam. His mother um, mistakenly thought that I was the one that was giving information to Adam and I was helping him out of some tight spots. I have to say, my experience of that interaction is completely the opposite. I was the one who, you know, we'd talk on the phone and the conversation would just go on and on in all different ways. And I'd come away so many times feeling like, like I just read a book and I'd learned whole new sets of perspectives on the different kinds of issues. And I learned a lot about the Armenian Genocide and was challenged to think through a lot of really important issues that I hadn't thought through before. Um, it's easy, especially in the field of philosophy, to come in to have very narrow, uh, a very narrow set of, fo uh, uh, of areas of focus. And um, Adam really pushed me to think about you know, challenging issues. Um, someone that sometimes doesn't hold back and talks about things that I don't know that much about, it, so I probably said a lot about those. But, um, but it was really important. Um, Getting back to the, this, this issue, um, I think of, when I think of this, it's a, uh, you know, I can give you a few examples of what I'm talking about, and they're a little bit idiosyncratic or subjective. That is, these are the kinds of things that I've learned from, from the Armenian Genocide and from other particular cases I'm going to touch on. Um, but I think there's a lot more, and different people approaching from different perspectives are going to pull different lessons from these issues. Um, for instance, from the Holocaust, there are, all, there are a lot of, um, you know, things that people touch on, like the industrial nature of the Holocaust and the use of, for instance, medical research, which happens in other cases, but it was developed in, in a very um, significant way in the Holocaust. Um, the role of the bureaucracy, a certain kind of very efficient, even cold, rationalized bureaucracy. For me, one of the interesting things about the Holocaust, and these are, of course, interesting, is the relationship between individual prejudice and a structure of racist domination. And typically, the way that people who talk about that relationship in our society, and you know, do critical race theory and so forth, talk about it, is that it's the structure that's kind of there that produces the individual behaviors. That is, when people in our society have racist attitudes, it's not about the racism, it's about the way our society is structured that produces those attitudes. Not to excuse them on an individual level, but to understand that that stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. And it's not just those people that are a problem, it's a bigger, broader set of value problems, structural problems, and, and other kinds of political issues that we need to look at, ethical issues that we need to look at, beyond just individuals. When I look at the Holocaust, and I may get into trouble um, uh, saying this, because, you know, again, it's my interpretation, but one of the things I'm struck by is the way in which the Nazis kind of built themselves out of individual prejudice up to this incredible organi organizational structure of racism that an entire society was built around. Um, they took the seeds of kind of anti-Semitism in 19th century Germany and built those up. And that, for me, is very frightening because it says that we can start with relatively unappreciated or unnoticed individual attitudes, and those can very quickly be built into something that is so devastating as the Holocaust. Um, there are, of course, many other insights. When I look at Cambodia, I, I am struck by certain things as well. 
For instance, I'm struck by the way in which um, a formerly very positive anti-colonial um, political theory, and, and especially so by, uh, for instance, Frantz Fanon, who's very important in, in helping to liberate Africa from its colonizers, in articulating a, a vision of the world in which nobody would be bound to some foreign power um, as mere you know, secondary citizens at the best and slaves at the least. But in Cambodia, that ideology, particularly Fanon, who's this, you know, an inspiration of Malcolm X and other people, a very important figure in world history, gets twisted into an ideology of genocide by Paul Pot and others. How am I doing? Almost? Okay. I'll stay through here. Um, there are many other kinds of things. When I look at Native American, Native American genocide, I see how uh, an important lesson is that a democracy can commit a genocide as long as enough people in the society have a, a kind of racial ideology that can work despite democratic safeguards. And that's also a very frightening thought for me because it means that democracy is not enough to overcome genocide. So it's certainly a prerequisite, but there's an ethical and political component that has to be there beyond that. In the case of the Armenian Genocide, there are, again, a number of lessons. Maybe we can talk about them. One that strikes me is the way in which apparently random, very localized, very um, uh, almost sporadic mob violence can be organized into a, a tightly choreographed, tightly organized, overall structure of extermination of more than a million people using relatively minimal, although some important technology in terms of communications, and a relatively inefficient bureaucracy. Um, if we get to the denial, can I, can I say one more thing and then I'm going to cut it off. If we get to the denial, okay, um, we see how easy it is, and there are many lessons to learn from the denial, but one of them is how easy it is, and this is something that I learned as an Armenian, um, kind of almost on my skin, but it's helped me understand the world much better than I would have otherwise. How easy it is for a human being to look directly at evidence of the destruction of a million, million and a half people and not see it and see something else. And that's helped me understand things like, for instance, you remember back uh, more than a dozen years ago to the Rodney King incident? And it helped me understand why some people who were watching a video of a guy being beaten for more than a minute on the ground came back and said, oh, that guy caused the problem. He wasn't really being beaten. He was actually the cause of the problem and so forth, which is exactly what's said about Armenians in terms of the genocide. To wrap up, we have to explore these different kinds of unique lessons of each genocide. The Armenian genocide is very important in this way in order to understand all the different possible ways in which genocide and other mass violence is happening today. To focus on one or just a narrow set of cases means we're going to miss things that people are doing that, that are very specialized, that pick up only something that's happened at one point in history. The broader an understanding of all these different distinct events we can have, the broader framework we're going to have for actually seeing the reality of violence that's confronting us. And we can't forget that these perpetrators today in Sudan and other places learn something from other past examples. Even torturers in the Armenian Genocide, if you recall, there's a case in Henry Morgenthau's um, uh, memoir, studied the Inquisition to learn torture techniques that they used against the Armenians. And if you understood the Inquisition adequately, then you could see what was happening with the Armenian Genocide that much better. Taking more time than I should have, thank you very much for your patience. give the four panelists the, the first opportunity if they wanted to speak to any of the uh, uh, points that, that their, their fellow panelists have just made at, at any greater length. Actually, I want to pull beyond, uh, beyond something that Richard just said, because I think that I'm interested, Richard, that as you start to do work internationally, where, where, do you, where do you see European scholars talking about this history? Uh, you know, in Germany, there's, there's schools in Germany that are actually now working with basic history to do some teacher training in the Armenian Genocide. It's the very first time. So when you're doing work internationally, where do you, where do you see scholars in the degree of trust? Is it, you know, especially with, I guess, especially with the EU debate? Well, I'm, I'm finding that uh, mainly within the universities, uh, I was at Montpellier 
in France, uh, and I'm also finding that uh, the comparative approach is working. Uh, Center for uh, Jewish and Eastern Christian Center uh, Center for uh, Jewish and Eastern Christian Studies, bringing together uh, a, a conference on genocide, uh, genocide studies. So we, we, we take the comparative approach, but it doesn't have to be only comparative. Some people do what their thing is and talk about their thing. Uh, there's uh, uh, Europe tends to have a much stronger memory historical memory than the Americans have. Europeans tend to be, a, there's a continuity of memory. Uh, there is a negative aspect of it that we have to be careful not to fall into the trap and that there's a great deal of anti-Turkish prejudice in Europe because of the guest workers and the uh, membership and so forth. And it's easy to fall into that trap. You have to be very careful to distance ourselves from, uh, from that kind of prejudicial action and what we have a just cause to, uh, to advance. Uh, we, should, uh, we should also remember that uh, Armenians have frequently been used as pawns by great powers. They're used. And uh, the, even in this issue of the Armenian genocide, recognition of it as a condition for, precondition for Turkey's entry into the European Union, I'm not opposed to it. It might be a good idea, but let us be sure that those who are demanding it are sincere and that what is their real motivation? Is it truly human rights in the Armenian genocide or is it a means simply to block Turkish uh, entry? And ultimately, it will not be what the Armenians do or not do that will determine Turkey's entry into the European Union. So we should be careful not to be used. So that's the answer a lot of what I've learned from our colleague in Germany too, who is scared of how the uh, a colleague in Germany who is deeply passionate about teaching this history, who's actually going to be doing those workshops, is terrified, actually, about how uh, prejudice may be motivating some of the, the pressure to actually teach about this history and the pressure for human uses. It is a painful dilemma. You speak into the microphone, right here. Sorry about that. You speak into the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, what I was saying is that, it, that a colleague uh, of ours in Germany is really echoing that. He's worried that some, some of the good things that he gets to do, do workshop for teachers around educating around the Armenian genocide, may be building from folks who may not always have the best intentions. It, it might be of interest to you also to know that this whole question of the Armenian genocide, uh, we know still very little about them. There's so much more to know. We know, we know from the perspective of the victims. Uh, we have no doubt what occurred, we know what occurred, but we, uh, without uh, free uh, investigation of the Turkish sources and archives, we still don't know a lot of things about decision making, when was the actual decision made, made what is the direction, and also now there is a significantly growing debate among Armenian genocide scholars uh, on two issues. One is, where do we define the genocide by years? Is it, you know, we always talk about 1915, or we talk about 1915, 1922 with the burning of Smyrna and the uh, elimination of the Armenians of Giligia who were driven out, Marash and so forth in, in 1920, 22. Uh, but there is now a strong move among some Armenian scholars to insist that we have to take the date back to the 1870s or 1890s with the massacres of the pogroms and massacres of the 1890s and want to see this as a single uh, continuous process and insist that and even on the international arena when we talk about resolutions, etc., that we shouldn't only be talking about 1915, we should drive it back. Now, that raises a lot of other questions. Uh, having focused on 1915 all these years, are we suddenly going to say the Armenians have changed their mind and they want to decide that their genocide started in the 1890s? Uh, that's one issue that is on the table. And, and, the, and the second one is uh, the whole issue of premeditation. Uh, genocide, you know, to be genocide, it has to be premeditated. And uh, scholars, uh, and quite a number of rather prominent non-Armenian scholars, Norman Neymark, uh, Jay Winter, uh, Ronald Bloxham, uh, Ronald Sunni, who is Armenian, would say that uh, well, there probably, there was an Armenian problem, there was a contingency, probably planned to get rid of them, but without World War I and without what happened, it wouldn't, there would not have been a genocide, and that 
when the deportations began, maybe the Turkish authorities didn't mean genocide, but it, it deteriorated. I mean, one, you know, one act led to another and it became genocide, which is a position that stands against many Armenian scholars and scholarship who try to and do emphasize that there was, in fact, a plan already uh, before World War I. And that plan, that, uh, when I talk about sources, that uh, approach of premeditation is now being supported by our Turkish colleagues, our liberal Turkish colleagues, who are uh, all seeing that already in 1912, 1913, when Turkey lost uh, a pre-World War I war against the Balkan countries of Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, that, and lost all of their European territories, that already in 1912, 1913, they had decided their last fallback position was Asia Minor, where the Armenians lived, and that the non-Turkish, non-Muslim population had to be cleansed from this area. So this, you know, it, it, here we are 100 years later, and we're still debating on um, issues such as these, which are very critical, and uh, hopefully, increasingly, as our Turkish scholars join honestly and sincerely, that uh, we'll have some answers. I mean, imagine trying to understand the Holocaust without any German documents or uh, archives. And you know, sure, it happened. Sure, the victims can tell you a lot. But how about the decision-making process and so forth? Okay. Is there anything else? I can ask a zillion questions because I find these folks fascinating, but I also want to hear what y'all are suggesting. All right. I've got some questions here that I would like to pose to not necessarily anyone in particular, but whoever feels compelled to answer. Uh, now that there is this excellent textbook, uh, what other materials are needed to facilitate the teaching of the Armenian Genocide uh, by teachers who are otherwise probably largely uneducated on, on the subject? Do you want to start? I'll start, I'll start, I'll start with you too. I mean, I think that, I think what's got to happen, first of all, the professional development is incredibly, incredibly important. I, I you know, I can give anybody a lesson plan I can give anybody, you know, that those little those things are important. So I mean, I I'll tell you kind of strategically. I think the professional development is the number one priority. Number two, I think, is then if people come to workshop, they want some hand holding at first until they begin to start to understand this history and to start to feel their own way. So I think some directed lesson plans for this. But I also know that doing this systematically still remains a challenge when you're, you're still having teachers having to, you know, work for time to get out of the, out of the classroom, you know, you, when it's a substitute. So it's also trying to find money to bring teachers there for, schol for scholarships to try to bring people stipends. I think you need to try to provide some sort of training online for teachers so that they can go do this in their after hours if it's not something that their system sees as a priority. I think that they also then, once they've gone to workshops, they start to need people who can kind of guide them through taking that material into the classroom. So yesterday afternoon, I, I left the office, and I told you about this woman, uh, this is a great teacher. I'll do a pitch for her. It's a te teacher named Adrienne Bellingham. She's in, uh, she's in Lexington. And uh, that's right. And, and Sal Lopez, boy, Adrian, pretty good Sal. Sal talked about the Armenian genocide for years at Lexington High School. And really, at least, at least from my knowledge, I know the local pioneers in teaching this history is strongly, strongly dedicated south. But anyway, Adrian was meeting with the program associates, so she's saying, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm looking for resources. Here are the questions that I want to try to ask. And so that one-on-one -on -one guidance meant to her the world, because it was a chance to have some communication with somebody, some feedback, because her colleagues don't know this history at the school. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I mean the, the other things that I think that they knew, so I, I would suggest their professional development, some key lesson plans. I think that they also need video resources. And one of the things that uh, is fabulous for people who are teaching about the Holocaust is they're just wonderful, wonderful documentary resources that you can pull into the classroom and stories of survivors, but also just that historical background. One of the, one of the challenges is you, until, you don't, until you know that history, you get your challenge trying to give that lecture. How can I summarize 
who, and I think Richard describes it in part period. How can I describe some of the developments in the last half of the 19th century? Boy, I, could, I couldn't even find the Ottoman Empire on a map until last summer. So how do I do that? So the documentary resources become very, very important. I mean, I, I, I have a vision of each teacher going into this with a resource book, some key lesson plans, uh, a video, a workshop to go to, and a program associate will be able to follow up with that. I, I'm interested, though, you, you've worked in California statewide, Richard, when you were doing that initiative years ago. What were y'all thinking? Well, I'm not sure what I mean, but I would like to simply say that uh, those of us who were born in the first half of the 19th century uh, really have a very hard time comprehending what the possibilities and potentials are today. Many of us don't even use computers, and those of us I do barely can send emails. Uh, but there is so much potential now with the uh, technological revolution that has taken place. Every century has had its revolutions. But the enormity and the dependence and reliance now both of teachers and of students on the electronic media, the electronic way of information, the, uh, is just astounding uh, and there's just great potential and great fear because if those of you who have surfed, as they call it in their language, surfed the web, will realize that the denier literature out there is very increasingly sophisticated. Uh, and uh, people and students going to the uh, computers to get their information are immediately confronted with the denial sites. And they, you know, so, uh, so we need to deal with that. We need to uh, use that. Audiovisual is very, very important. Uh, as, and we're lacking, sorely lacking. In, in that aspect of, of it. Uh, so I just would like to make that emphasis that there, we're going to be left behind. We're going to be left behind unless we learn to use the technology that is now available to us. We have to find the people to use that technology, know that technology, use some of the information that those of us who are technologically ignorant that perhaps have some knowledge of information put this together as a team and to develop, uh, develop these sites. Sorry, if I can add a, a couple things. Yeah, I agree, first of all, Adam, about the video resources, and the reality is that can do a lot to add to a classroom experience, especially where students are, are increasingly in a video and internet environment outside of the classroom, so it's, it's important. And even feature films or you know, I mean, they don't have to be big Hollywood blockbusters, but, um, you know, it's interesting, I think, um, aesthetically as Adam McGuinn's uh, ARA was, it's also very complicated to use for teaching on this because there's a lot of ambiguity in, in the film that's kind of built into it that makes it open up the very questions that um, are, are, you know, kind of exploited by denial. Um, I think that's a, a little bit of a dangerous thing. I, I, I don't mean that that was his intention or anything like that, but it's just you have to really teach it within a, in a broader context of knowledge about the Indian genocide, which at the high school level is exactly what you're trying to build. Um, and there are some good, uh, I think uh, our Zartinian in Montreal, we're hopeful Adam and I have in contact with her, is going to have a couple, yeah, Mark, yeah, uh, have, have a couple of good films uh, on the way um, that will be useful for classroom use. Um, I should also point out a couple things. Um, Richard made a really good point about the, what's available on the internet, and just more generally, I think one really important thing isn't so much um, developing new resources as helping educators sort through the resources that are there. When in 1999, when the Genocide Curriculum Bill was passed in Massachusetts, there was um, added to it a list of possible resources. And although the denier element in Massachusetts couldn't stop the bill from going through, what they did was they added, they got added denial resources to the list of resources that were supposed to be used on a 14th century genocide. But if someone um, is just coming to this, a teacher who doesn't know that much about it, would just be teaching you know, slick denialist materials as if this is part of history. It's very dangerous stuff. I think Facing History does a great job of sorting through those. I've been present at workshop discussions where, where uh, among other things, um, helping people to think critically about what they're using and how to use it. Um, and I think also even more broadly, you know, what Adam said, um, support for teachers because this is, if we can use the term, a controversial issue. And, you know, I mean, we've all had our experiences with them go down here with the Niners and so forth, and you know, and at this point you, you get used to it, it's not pleasant, but you deal with it. But someone who's just kind of considering talking about the Armenian Genocide and gets hit with 
um, an administrator maybe who's squeamish about a controversy or somebody in the community who's against teaching this, okay? Doesn't have, it, it's not even just a moral question, they may be really committed to doing the right thing, but probably doesn't have the knowledge and so forth to deal with that, to counter those kinds of questions. And for some, it's just easier at a certain point in a, in a very overstressed work environment for teachers just to, to walk away from it. It's just too much to deal with. And there are other issues, human rights issues, that they can deal with that are less controversial. Um, and I would add a, a, a final thing, uh, actually two final things. One is that training teachers on how to integrate this kind of curriculum into a much broader set of issues that don't seem to have anything to do with genocide, and human rights, and so forth. I mean, I teach, um, maybe it's not that much of a stretch, but I teach these kinds of issues um, are, you know, genocide denial, for instance, in an ethics class, because I think that's really important. How do we deal with this as an issue? And that's not a standard thing in philosophical ethics. Or in a philosophy of history course, um, I've been able to teach a lot of this. Um, and a last thing, I think um, Nicole Bartanian at, at Richard's most recent conference um, made an excellent point that the standards that teachers are held to have a huge impact on the kinds of things they teach, and I think Adam alluded to this as well. Um, when they're teaching, for instance, to the MCAS, they don't have the flexibility to spend time on things that may be really important, but may not be quite the kinds of things that you can teach, uh, that you can test in the, in the way that MCAS tests students. And so they de-emphasize things like this kind of curriculum. And, and it's a problem that we have to face. And I'll also say that a lot of teachers say, you know what, this is important, and take the time. I mean, and should have engaged to. Some people are beginning to leave. Let me urge everyone to leave, buy a couple of books on your way out and uh, distribute them. If you don't want to keep them, distribute them to your uh, school district, to uh, departments. Uh, we're all pretty well healed now as a community. We can afford to buy four or five of these and uh, distribute them. So let me urge each of you, I'm doing the pitch now that they probably don't want to, feel like they want to do, but won't do. Uh, as we leave, let's, uh, let's purchase two or three of those books and, uh, and, and distribute them to family and to those who may be interested. Thank you. I'll add this pitch too, as long as we're pitching. Uh, those of you who know people, are friends with people, or have family who have kids in the public schools or who will be in the public schools, and if they weren't here tonight, I hope you will tell them tomorrow that perhaps they should have been because that the only real hope we have of getting the Armenian Genocide understood and taught is if people actually from the Armenian community, for starters anyway, uh, educate themselves on the subject. And that's, that's my little soapbox speech. Now, the questions were, and there are a couple here that are related, how can this guide, the Facing History Guide, be helpful when teachers do not have the time to study the sources in it and uh, they need to learn about it first before they can develop a curriculum and lesson plans for their students. Who is going to pay for this and how is it going to be accomplished? Um, Facing History offers institutes. Uh, right now we hold 40 institutes in the summer and they're five days each and they're all over the world. And in those institutes, the Armenian Genocide is taught, or will be taught. In addition, we hold workshops all year, all over the country. We have eight offices across the country. And then, we know that's not enough. So we use the technology and now have distance courses online. We could sit down and, with the strategy, decide what big looks like for the history of the Armenian Genocide. And we could decide how many institutes we wanted to have over a five year period, where we wanted to have them in this country and outside of this country. It's all a matter of the individual will and the political will. I do not think you can depend on public school systems. You all know that there are 100 million children in the elementary school age worldwide who are not in school elementary school. There are 100 million children of high school age in this world who are not in school. And there are approximately 50 million kids who are in schools that preach and teach hate. These are World Bank statistics. In the United States, if you would just read one case scenario, try New Orleans, try Bob Herbert's article in the New York Times, see how many kids are in high school. 
how many kids have dropped out in a year. The school systems in the United States are under, under siege. There are vouchers going so that kids can leave schools. There are charter schools. There are religious schools. There are interfaith schools. Anything but the public space. And so I personally don't depend on the public school administrators or the mandates in these states to try to bring this kind of curriculum into the school system. I think it takes the nonprofit sector. I think it takes the advocacy, the volunteerism, and the philanthropy, coupled with the quality and the legitimate scholarship to make a difference. And I think it's up to you all to say to us, you demonstrate to me that with my philanthropy, you can make a difference. Because I know that we can respond. We can bring teachers. We can market the book. We can bundle the materials with digital video. We can do this work. But you cannot wait for the school systems to do it. It will not happen. And so the advocacy that Facing History is involved in, we're a 501c3, we can't go out and be political, but we can go out and try to persuade. And what we try to do is persuade philanthropists, Armenian and non-Armenian, that you have an obligation to the next generation to use the story of your parents and grandparents to prevent this from ever happening to anyone else. You have, no, you have no other reason to have children in this world but to want them to be caring and compassionate and citizens of the world. And so your story deserves to be told. And I do not think you can wait for the will of the public schools. You talk about the standards and the tests. There's always some fad that goes on. Anti-standards will be the next generation of standards. Schools are a mess. They just are a mess. Go look at the statistics. And they're so politicized. And the textbooks only sell if they sell in Texas and California. This is not news. And you cannot expect a textbook that sells in Texas and California to go in-depth on anything that smacks of controversy that will in any way expect the teacher to know anything. It just won't happen. So if you want adult development and you want to value education, you have to model how to do that with teachers. You have to do what my husband has had all of his professional life. He has had grand rounds. He has been a professor who teaches the next generation of doctors. And they never stop teaching and they never stop learning. But we expect a 26-year-old teacher to go into a school system and teach. How in the world could they be able to teach this history when it's not in their textbooks and it's not in their pre-service education? So Facing History now uses technology. It's now going to higher ed institutions and looking for the teachers who are teaching the next generation of teachers, pre-service teachers. We're looking outside of the school systems to find the educators and then to help those educators with the resources. And we model the change that happens in the educators by first showing the kind of change that can happen with, that happened to us. And then they go in the classroom and discover that magic that happens when kids are truly asked to take seriously very important material. And it's just, I have to tell you, it's labor intensive. It just is. You can't get it simply. And it, it takes will. So, Margo is not saying we ignore the public schools or public school teachers. She's saying we don't rely on the public schools to do the training, but we don't ignore the public school teachers because they're a very important ingredient and if I, if of I the program. That, right. No question. The target of the teachers, wherever they are, outside or inside the schools, right. and the target of the community. If you want to know how facing history gets into school systems and how we started, it's actually what Richard Hovindisi said. Because somebody said, I'm going to take a resource book and I'm going to send it to a library or I'm going to ask a parent or I know somebody on the school committee. Chicago, we've been trying to get into the Chicago school system for years. That doesn't mean that we don't have thousands of Chicago teachers. We do. But if you want systemic change in a school system that changes its superintendent constantly and the schools are underfunded and they're 
back and forth with the politics of the time. And you have to find another way to find the teachers. And you will find in every school system extraordinary superintendents. You will find in every school system great principals. But you'll also find really committed parents. And parents make the change. They have the will. And if you want to know how we got into a lot of schools in the beginning, it was through librarians. Librarians read. So Facing History's model was to invite the librarians, the art teachers, the principals, the superintendents, the administrators, and work with them first so that the Petri dish was ready once a teacher came to an institute and then came back into a school with a brand new curriculum. So you're, you're absolutely right. We want an educator wherever we can find them. I'm just trying to say, if you want to depend right now on a superintendent or on a textbook to include in the Armenian genocide in the way it should be included, I don't think you should wait for that to happen. And nobody has in their budgets the kind of professional development that Facing History provides. It is a nonprofit marriage with the public school system that will allow this kind of program to start to develop and get emerging. I want to ask uh, any of you really to, to speak about the Massachusetts bill from a few years back. Uh, it, it's my understanding that it endorses, so to speak, the teaching of the Armenian Genocide without requiring it. it, it am I incorrect in that? And it, at any rate, how do we get from the book to Massachusetts students using the book? Actually, it's on the last point. It does say it does say it mandates it, and it, the Armenian genocide is one of the four cases that are. Can oh, you? Sorry. It mandates it, and the Armenian genocide is one of the four cases in Massachusetts that's outlined as one of the things that should be taught. Um, but there's also another problem that that's come up, which is, um, and and this is a, a separate kind of issue that impacts. But a lot of teachers, and this came up before, are a little bit concerned when they're being told from a kind of central authority that there are a hundred different things they're mandated to teach. Um, and sometimes there's a backlash of resentment that has to do much more with just being, feeling like you don't have control of your own classroom, I mean, at, a, at a, almost a micromanagement level. Um, and that came up even in the, in the, in the Massachusetts um, legislature. That was one of the points of, of resistance was just not having um, state mandates at all. Um, and I mean, that, uh, that, that bill was, was part of uh, the target of that backlash. So, so I went on the DOE website the other day, Department of Education, and you cut you cut it out right out of the period when they're teaching World War One. So when they're teaching World War One, they are supposed to teach the Armenian genocide. There, there it is. There it is mandated. But what's but it, but what's interesting, and, it, and it, it's a point I was trying to talk, talk about, and Henry just picked up on, is that people do feel that pressure. And so what what nonprofits have the potential to do with, I think, again, with what Margot was saying, with the support of philanthropy, is to say, you know what. This shouldn't be a burden. What we're here to do is, if you're supposed to do it, here's the resources and here's the training which you should have had if it's going to be a mandated education. And we know it's important. And I think that what pe teachers do, even if sometimes when they come in resistant, say, wow, they're woken by the issues in the history. I've talked to our California offices about this a lot, actually, because the California mandate, people are aware of it. It's interesting, the layers of bureaucracy. Sometimes teachers aren't even aware of the mandate here. You know, or the chairman might, or the superintendent might. <coughs> but the, the California offices feel that the Armenian Genocide Resource Book has been a gift to the teachers of California, because they felt for years that they were supposed to teach this, and while the, the material they were, were looking for was out of print, the professional development wasn't always there, so what's been, it's been a great gift that the San Francisco and the Los Angeles offices have been able to go to school districts. I think they were in Montebello, I can't remember, they were in Glendale last year, going to different school districts and saying, here, you know, to, to, to the district saying that we know that you're not going to provide it, but we have the resources to, do, to, resources to do that with funding that they've gotten from outside the public school system. And it's a gift, and the workshops are packed. I mean, thousands of people are here. I just looked, at, actually, I didn't look it up. Shannon looked it up the other day. Shannon's in here somewhere. There were 25 workshops that Facing History did uh, on the Armenian Genocide the last year. And it's interesting because I would say there were about four or five of those that were originally pre-scheduled on calendars, but districts came to us excited at the opportunity of bringing it into the classroom. So that's, that's one way to move from mandate 
and without the antagonism. Uh, uh, in my experience, um, uh, people sometimes find out, and I'll talk about facing history in different contexts, and, uh, and I'll run into somebody who, oh yeah, I did a training and it's great, or I know somebody that did this and they think the world of the organization. Teachers that go through the training and facing history come out really, really excited about dealing with really hard issues, and they do it really well, um, have such a great reputation, and I'm wondering, and this is really just a question to pick up on the practical end, um, is this something that, um, and I haven't thought about this before, but it, you can maybe clarify this. I mean, is this something where a group of parents can get together, raise some money for a local school to fund just sending a teacher, have a little school-wide, uh, I don't know, not contest is the right word, but uh, um, process where they might choose a teacher to send from their school, that type of thing? Is that how it works, or are there other ways people can actually do practical things to, to get teachers in your doors? You know, there are, there are very clever parents who figure out ways to, so the clever parents who figure out ways to get um, facing history into their school systems. And sometimes they do provide the scholarship for the teachers, sometimes they provide the scholarship for all the workshop, and sometimes they provide us the opportunity to print the brochures, to get out to the administrators and fill the workshops. I have to echo also what Richard Govanese has said about the technology. Until you've been in a classroom, you can't imagine what a facing history classroom looks like. Until you've been in an institute where they're teaching about the Armenian genocide, you can't imagine what it's like. You just can't. So I would suggest, at least at that level, perhaps we all should think about an adult ed program, which is how facing history began, for you or your, you and your children, or you and your family, or some way filling an adult ed course where you actually take the course to see what it would be like to struggle with these issues given who you are as a community. But the technology, the online courses can be filled so easily and it takes time to create that course. We do not have one and we should. It would be state of the art, no one else has it in the world, and we should create an institute that people can take 24-7 anywhere and I'll tell you what we learned today. It costs $20 a word, 290,000 words in the Facing History Holocaust and Human Behavior Resource Book. You figure the math. It costs a lot of money to translate this material. But if you want this to be sustainable over time, and you think method, what methods and what strategies and what tactics you need to do to make sure that you're covering all your bases, that the videos are getting into digital form, that they're being put on so that Google makes sure that they go from anyone who goes on looking for genocide go, finds their way to the Armenian <clears throat> genocide, finds their way to facing history. You offer the workshops, you create the courses online, and you make sure that there's an opportunity to train people who will keep that work facilitated and supported and the institutes happening. I mean, we know how to do it. We've been doing it for 30 years. But it, the book is now out. It is absolutely so well reviewed. And it is so well taken. It is not a textbook. It is a resource book. It can be used at college level. It can be used at high school levels. And you don't go from here to there with it. You learn as a teacher how to use pieces that work for you in your classroom. And you build a way to make people understand how important this history is. So, Technology will bring millions and millions and millions to a face of history online workshop and one doesn't do this. I want to ask one or two more questions. Uh, since the focus in classrooms is often limited to what will be tested, what efforts are being made to educate the, the testers, the test the people who write the tests? Did any in Massachusetts, facing history was part of the movement at the, at the beginning to try to do that, and it's, and it's too bad because it, the testing system became very political. So we were part of a, an organization, and at first of the, uh, the social studies department was very welcoming in trying to bring together groups to try to figure out what materials should be tested and what those uh, would look like. In education, often as a political football, and the new people came in, and they didn't want the last group's people, and, uh, and the next group's people won't like this group's people. And so 
that that was the attempt in Massachusetts. I think a lot of our work, though, is happening with pre-service education because it's working through schools of ed that you get the next level of policy people. So we have, we're working on our relationships. I, I guess I was told by lawyers not to be safe partnership. But working on relationships with New York University, working on relationships with Harvard, Harvard University School of Education, and those sorts of relationships, I think will ultimately, hopefully, make a difference. And we're also doing a tremendous amount of educational research. Because, you know, I don't, I don't know what the 10 years outcomes are on those standardized tests, but I know what, the, I know what kids get in out facing history classrooms. We've done quality educational research. I feel like an app for ourselves. But, uh, but that's what we should be testing. We should be testing, you know, not just the specific dates, because I don't know where people are going to be at in three years from now. And so we're doing the educational research and getting that out in policy journals. And hopefully, that's the beginning. You know, we, again, we're 501c3. It's not political, it's education by persuasion. Is that how you would have answered that question? All right. <laughs> Uh, the last question I want to ask is, we have mandates now in California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Illinois, and one Pseudo other. Pseudo mandates in, in Illinois. Illinois is recommended, but yeah. It, and that's presumably been a great struggle. What, what about the other 40 odd states where there aren't sizable Armenian populations? How, how is the Armenian genocide ever going to be taught in Boise? Not to pick on Boise, by the way, it just came to mind. <laughs> well, I mean, what's interesting is those are the folks who came to the online workshop, the online forum that, that we had. I mean, it's, it's, what's amazing is I think there really is a change about this. I, I, I think if you pick up, I was, I, I think, you know, I've been skeptical. I so, you know, you never read about the Armenian genocide, it's never anywhere. I, I picked up the newspaper on Friday. There was an article about the Armenian Genocide Conference in Istanbul. There was an article on Saturday. There was an article today about the EU, the EU debates. So it's actually interesting. It's, it's becoming part of public consciousness. So I think more and more people are trying, trying to make sense of this. There's an article, Der Spiegel. The best article I read on the Armenian Genocide all year was at Der Spiegel, a, 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 German, a German magazine. Well, newspaper, but this is a, a magazine edition. Uh, so I think there's an arousing of, of public consciousness around this history, and I think it's that is where the folks like Samantha Power, like Gary Bass, and you know Peter Blakey's book just won the Lemkin Prize as the best book on uh, on genocide scholarship. What is it for two years? I think that's uh, by the International Association of Genocide Scholars. So I think there there have been teachers who are fascinated by this history, and they find it through the web, through the workshops, and. I, I promise you it, it's transformative. I, I want to give